So uh, the next speaker will be Robert Anton Wilson, and he's known for writing uh, such works as the Illuminatus Trilogy. He's editor of Trajectories. He's also written Schrodinger's Cat, The Cosmic Trigger, Sex and Drugs. He's a columnist for The Realist and Magical Blend, and a lecturer and an essayist on futurism and quantum psychology. Robert Anton Wilson. This is your brain. <laughs> this is stupid, uninformed television commercials about drugs. <laughs> this, <clears throat> this is your brain after you've been hit by those television commercials. <laughs> Well, this is really quite a get-together. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, it's great to see all your faces out there, ladies, gentlemen, and narcs. <laughs> you, uh... Everybody look around and see if you can spot the narcs. <laughs> they're, they're the ones who look like hippies. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you all know, uh, uh, since it was in Herb Cain's column over ten years ago, that if you rearrange the letters of Ronald Wilson Reagan, you get insane Anglo warlord. That's, uh, that's pretty well known. Uh, do you know what you get if you rearrange the letters of George Herbert Walker Bush? You get huge berserk rebel warthog. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, sort of sums up the state of the nation. Uh, Bush did... Uh... About the Democrats. <laughs> Mel Levine. Somebody asked me to tell a joke about the Democrats, so I just told a joke about the Democrats. Mel Levine is a Democrat. Uh, where was I before I was so rudely interrupted? Uh, oh, yeah, huge berserk rebel warthog. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bush did a State of the Union message a few nights ago. And uh, all day wondering what he was going to say, my mind kept going back to, the, to Woodstock, not the event, the movie. In the movie, there's an old man in Woodstock. Uh, they interview several people who lived in the town about what they thought of the Woodstock Festival. And this one old man, he comes on screen and he says, It's a shitty mess. You want my opinion? It's a shitty mess. And I, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be great if George Bush were that honest and direct? And he got up and he, You want to know the State of the Union? It's a shitty mess. That's what it is. It's a shitty mess. The SNLs have collapsed. The banks are collapsing. Our streets look like the third world. They're so full of starving homeless people. It's a shitty mess. No, but Bush doesn't say anything like that. Uh, uh, when we had an insane Anglo warlord, at least we knew where we stood. That's something you can relate to. There's been a lot of insane Anglo warlords. But now we've got this huge berserk rebel warthog, and, we're, and now we're living in surrealism. It's, it's interesting, this is a conference about psychedelics, but you hardly need psychedelics nowadays. Just turn on the television. Uh, I, on the plane I took coming up here, uh, somebody dropped a Coca-Cola can after they were through with it. It fell off their tray and it rolled down the aisle of the plane. And you never saw so much panic in your life. Uh, uh, the, the huge... The huge rebel, uh, <laughs> the huge berserk rebel warthog has gone in and started a war with the one people on the whole planet who are best known for having perpetual vendettas. They never give up. <laughs> they conquered southern Europe in the 7th century. They controlled Sicily and Spain and parts of southern Italy. 
And that's how the whole concept of vendetta got into our culture. It's originally an Arabian invention, and it means you never give up. If they defeat you, you teach your children so they can fight back in the next generation. Uh, and terrorism is an honorable method of fighting back when you're a third world people and you're being attacked by a superpower with all sorts of uh, modern technology. So they will never give up, and we all might as well get used to the fact when you see a Coca-Cola can rolling around, you're going to jump. <laughs> when you get on the underground in London, they've had a lot more experience with this kind of thing than we have. When you get on the underground in London, you see signs. If you see an unaccompanied package, do not take it to lost and found. Get off at the next stop and notify the bomb squad at once. We are going to have to get used to signs like that. The, uh, the huge berserk rebel warthog is stirred up uh, a part of the world that nobody should really go in and stir up. It's much funnier when I'm talking about what you can do with his name than when I'm talking about what he's been doing. The, uh, uh, fortunately, I, I, I always maintain a mildly LSD perspective. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, uh, he actually said, uh, uh, look at who I picked for vice president. That will tell you all about me. That, that was quoted in Esquire two years ago at the end of the year when they had their most amazing quotes of the year. George Herbert Walker Bush said, look who I picked for vice president. That will tell you all about me. Okay, so uh, look at Dan Quayle. He went over there and he told the troops this will not be another Vietnam. And somebody yelled, damn right or you wouldn't be here. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> And he got caught, marshaled, and shot the next day. Uh, maybe. Maybe I made that up. Uh, you know, a quail is a cross between a chicken and a hawk. Uh, what's, what's, really, what's really weird, what's really very extremely weird, is everybody knows bush means pubic hair. That, that's, that, that is slang from one coast to the other. However, in many parts of this country, quail means vagina. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard that. Uh, that's, uh, it's getting a bit archaic. Maybe it's 1950s or even 1940s or 30s slang, but a lot of people remember it. So Bush says, look who I picked for vice president. That'll tell you all about me. He's got a name that means pubic hair, and he picks a vice presidential candidate with nothing to recommend him except that his name means vagina. What is he trying to tell us? I can't figure, you know, you know, the last thing Reagan did before leaving the White House, he had uh, surgery on his ass. And, and the first thing Bush did after being inaugurated was have surgery on his middle finger. <laughs> what, 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 are they, what are they, what kind of message are they sending us? <clears throat> I, I was speaking in Maui about uh, two months ago and uh, I heard on the television while I was over there that the Defense Department has shipped 60,000 body bags to the Mideast. That was uh, December 2nd. That was uh, two months ago exactly. 60,000 body bags. This was while they were telling us it's going to be a surgical strike and it'll be over in a week and everybody will be home. Meanwhile, they're shipping 60,000 body bags over there. And I thought... For years in my seminars, I've been quoting this story about Uspensky. Uspensky, Prince Peter Uspensky studied with Gurdjieff. And one of the main teachings of the Gurdjieff schools is that uh, human beings at this stage of evolution are so controlled by conditioned reflexes that they might as well be robots. They're completely mechanical. Uh, anybody who's ever contacted the Gary Jeff work has heard at least that much. Try to see how mechanical you are as a first step in the Gary Jeff work. Uspensky couldn't understand what Gary Jeff meant about people being mechanical until 1914 when war was declared. And one day Uspensky saw a truck headed for the front and it was full of artificial legs. And it suddenly hit Uspensky that these... The, uh, the shooting had hardly started. The troops were just moving up to the front. It suddenly occurred to them, this truck full of legs, these were, these were not for soldiers who'd had their legs blown off already. 
This was for soldiers whose legs were going to be blown off. And Uspensky had a background in mathematics and statistics, and he knew how the Russian War Department calculated how many legs were going to get blown off so they know how many artificial legs to send up to replace them. And suddenly he realized, my God, this is all mechanical. If there was anybody awake on the planet, those guys would get the hell out of there. Why would anybody go someplace where their legs are going to get blown off if they were awake and knew where they were, who they are, and what the hell is going on around them? <laughs> so there I was in Maui two months ago, and I hear they're sending 60,000 body bags to the Mideast, and I suddenly felt just like Uspensky. What the hell is going on on this planet? Are we all really in a deep state of hypnosis? As Gary Jeff said, are we all totally mechanical? Well, uh, you may wonder when I'm ever going to get around to the topic of this conference. <laughs> uh, for the last uh, nearly 30 years, I have been uh, one of the many voices, not the best known and not the loudest, but one of the many voices saying our government's policy on drugs is totally crazy. It's bonkers, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't accomplish anything. And trying to get this message through, trying to have some impact, over a period of uh, going on 30 years now, I have begun to realize certain things about government. In, in the first place, uh, all governments, even if they're allegedly democratic, they all claim papal infallibility. Uh, they don't make the claim explicit like the Vatican does, but the general attitude of the government on drugs can be summarized very simply. Everything they've made illegal is totally pernicious, nefarious, and it'll uh, turn your brain into a fried egg. Everything they've left legal, including alcohol and nicotine and caffeine, is perfectly safe. Take as much of it as you want. And they have never made a mistake. Everything they made illegal is bad. Everything they've left legal is good. And uh, any information to the contrary comes from nuts with PhDs, MDs, and other fake, uh, other credentials like that that are supposed to fake us out. But our politicians are not faked out just by the fact that people are working scientists and have knowledge of what they're talking about. <laughs> because the government is never wrong. And this is exactly the attitude we see in, uh, in what Mark Twain called the war psychoses. Mark Twain wrote a really fascinating essay on that. He pointed out before a war there is widespread opposition. As it becomes obvious, the government is building up to starting a war. Many voices speak out, especially among the Rev clergy and in the intellectual communities, but also scattered throughout the population. As war gets closer, the proportion gradually changes. As soon as war is declared, virtually everybody in the country is in favor of the war, and the resistors are a tiny minority. And Mark Twain wrote a very interesting study of this back in uh, 1898, apropos of the Spanish-American War. We have just had a chance to see the whole process happen again. And now we hear voices saying we must support our president. If you don't support your president, you're unpatriotic. This is what Wilhelm Reich in the mass psychology of fascism called the Fuhrer Prinzip. Uh, this goes back to the days when we were ruled by sun kings. Tribal people uh, have an entirely different structure, which uh, Rianne Eisler calls partnership society, which is based on voluntary association. Civilization begins with the Sun Kings. And who were the Sun Kings? They were the people who had armies with bronze tips on their spears. As soon as bronze was discovered, the people who put bronze on their spears were tougher than anybody else. That was the atom bomb of that time. And the ones who were best at murdering their neighbors built up huge empires and then declared they were gods. They were descended from the sun. Uh, you find this all over the Orient. You find it among the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. You find as Rome declined from a republic, such as we once had here, into a continually war-making uh, empire, such as we now have here, uh, the emperors became divine. As late as the 18th century, Louis XIV was still called the Sun King as part of that tradition. 
Nobody contradicts God. In those days, if you contradicted the head of state, uh, it meant you were going to be killed right away, now, not just for treason, but for blasphemy. The kings were divine. Now, this has a ethological background. There's a tendency among primates to have an alpha male leading the pack, and everybody is afraid to get too testy with the alpha male. Tim Leary calls this ordinary, ordinary primate politics. Now, this is why it is so hard to get a message through to the government. In the first place, they have this conditioned reflex that they are always right, this papal infallibility, and it doesn't matter how much evidence there is to contradict them, they hate to admit a mistake. Uh, the Dreyfus case. Most people consider the Dreyfus case a horrible example of anti-Semitism, which, which is one way of looking at it. Uh, Dreyfus happened to be Jewish, but supposing he wasn't Jewish, everything would have happened exactly the same way once they convicted him. For those of you who don't remember French history, Dreyfus was accused of spying, of passing on intelligence to the German army. It was later conclusively proven that he was innocent. The real spy actually wrote a confession. His name was Esterhazy. It took seven years after that before Dreyfus got out of prison because the French government could not admit they were wrong. And if Dreyfus had been as goyish as uh, Barry Fitzgerald, it, it would have been the same because governments can't admit they're wrong. Everybody with more than a half inch of forehead who's able to decipher English words on paper knows that marijuana is a totally harmless herb. The government declared it was dangerous in 1937, and getting them to back down on that is like getting Dreyfus out of prison. It takes years and years and years of struggle. This war in the Persian Gulf is the stupidest goddamn thing I have seen in the whole history of my whole history of observing governmental stupidity, but you can't get them to back down. <clears throat> And this does not just exist in government circles. The human race has been domesticated for so long that most people have a conditioned reflex. If they're up there in a position of power, we must bow down and obey them. Uh, governments do not even have to declare papal infallibility. The average person attributes it to them whether they claim it or not. And so the government doesn't have to go around saying it's a crime to criticize us. They have got after 6,000 years of patriarchal authoritarian civilization, most people spontaneously cry out, what, you disagree with the government? You should go somewhere else. You should, you should be thrown in prison. Why don't you go to another country you like better? Uh, you should be shot. Uh, support our troops. Uh, if you disagree with them about drugs, oh, you must be one of those potheads yourself. How much coke have you sniffed lately? Uh, Cocaine, to digress a moment, cocaine is nature's way of telling you you've got too much money. <laughs> uh, crack, crack is nature's way of telling you you're part of the population problem and we'd be better off without you. The, the government has done a great deal of talking in the last couple of years about the horrible problems of crack, and I don't want to contradict anything they've said about that. It is a horrible problem. Uh, but they're still spending 70% of their drug budget tracking down pot smokers. If you point this out, you're disloyal, you're unpatriotic, and, you're not, and it's the sin against the Holy Ghost. Governments are supposed to be infallible. And most people believe it. Uh, uh, they've been trained that way for 6,000 years, the Führer principle. Wilhelm Reich in the mass psychology of fascism talks about intelligent discussions with Nazi party members when he was a psychiatrist in Germany before he had to get out. And he would point out errors in logic in the Nazi position or in official declarations. And the answer would be, uh, well, Hitler knows things that I don't know. Uh, this is the basic primate instinct to obey the alpha male. Uh, this is complicated by what I call the snafu principle. Uh, the snafu principle is that nobody likes to tell the complete truth to somebody who has power over them. 
as an example, is there anybody in this audience, anywhere, anybody who would claim that in your dealings with government officials you've ever told them the complete truth? <laughs> How about your dealings with university officials? <laughs> How about your dealings with your parents? Well, uh, there are people here who look old enough to be graduates and have jobs. Do you ever tell the truth to your boss, the complete total truth about anything? Whenever anybody has power over you, if they can throw your ass in jail, like they did to Dr. Leary, if they can burn your books, like they did to Dr. Reich before they threw him in jail, if they can write out the pink slip, which means you're unemployed and have about six weeks to find another job before you join the other homeless people on the streets, if they have that kind of power, you're going to tell them what they want to hear. Uh, our civilization has been based on patriarchal authoritarian principles for 6,000 years, and we're so used to it, we can't think outside that framework. But inside that framework, we have an absolute guarantee that the people on the top never know what the f*** is going on anywhere. <laughs> because everybody has motives to lie to those above them. So at the lowest ranks of the bureaucracy, we're, they're all, we're all telling them all the bull we can to get them off our case, or to keep them from getting interested in our case, they're all passing along more bull to the people above them so they won't get fired. And up at the top, all the bull accumulates, which no doubt explains why Saddam Hussein thinks he can defeat the, uh, the whole Western world. Uh, he's hearing nothing but bull because he has the authority to have people shot if they disagree with him. But George Bush is hearing just as much bull because he's at the top of the hierarchy here. Uh, basically, authoritarian civilization is based on the, on the bottom as a burden of nescience. If you're near the bottom of the pyramid, anything you see, hear, smell, taste, read, deduce, discover by microscopes, telescopes, or any other scientific instruments, and learn through your own personal experience or through laboratory tests, any of that you're not supposed to know about unless it agrees with what's coming down from above. If any of your reports disagree with what's coming down from above, if you're providing accurate feedback, eventually you're going to get into trouble. So by the law of the survival of the fittest, those who survive longest in comfortable jobs in corporations, universities, and such places are those who learn never to send any signals that disagree with what's coming down from on top. So at the bottom, everybody has a burden of nescience. Now, nobody wants to feel like a coward all the time. So instead of noticing that what you have seen and observed yourself disagrees with what you're being told, it's better to start believing what you're being told. And then the next step is to try to shut up anybody who may also have dissenting reports about what's going on. In 1917, a sociologist did a little experiment to see how many people approved of the Bill of Rights. It turned out the majority rejected it. This was explained after the war was over. Other sociologists wrote criticisms of it, and they said, well, that was wartime hysteria. So somebody else did a study in the middle of the 1920s when the United States was not at war with anybody. When we were very prosperous, the Depression hadn't hit yet. It turned out the majority rejected the Bill of Rights. This has been done repeatedly. Every decade, somebody has repeated the experiment. The majority always rejects the Bill of Rights because the Bill of Rights is based on assumptions that entirely contradict the patriarchal authoritarian structure. It's based on the idea that the most intelligent government has feedback in the cybernetic sense, so messages can come in from everywhere and the government can build an accurate map of what's going on and we can be governed by facts instead of by mythology. Everybody rejects that. The majority rejects it, I mean, not everybody. I assume the group we've got here today is cons consists 90% of heretics and 10% of narcs, as I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the basic structure is what comes down from on top must be believed. Any dissenting voices should be stifled. We have the Bill of Rights just because of a conspiracy of aristocratic Freemasons in the 18th century. The masses have never liked it, and they'd love to get rid of it. The masses always long for fascism. Every time they're given a free choice, they'll pick the most fascist of the two candidates. 
<clears throat> this is 6,000 years of conditioning in this way of thinking. Now, of course, if we have a bur- if everybody is, has this burden of nescience on the bottom, if they're not supposed to see, hear, smell, or otherwise deduce anything that contradicts the official reality map from above, and if everything that gets fed upwards has to accord with what's already come down from up there, eventually the people on the top with their burden of omniscience who are supposed to be doing all the seeing, hearing, smelling, thinking, and deciding for the whole society, since they're being fed on nothing but both, their burden of omniscience gradually becomes a burden of nescience also. Communication is only possible between equals. In any authoritarian family, the authority is lied to all the time. The children lie to authoritarian parents. Before women's liberation, women lied to authoritarian husbands. They're less inclined to do that now, or some of them are. But in every authoritarian structure, those on the bottom lie as much as is necessary to make their lives comfortable. Democracy, uh, at least our form of it, is embodied in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, presupposes an entirely different structure where if somebody is standing on my foot, I have the right to yell, hey, you're standing on my foot. The authoritarian structure is I got to look first and see whether they have authority to stand on my foot. (laughs) The right to dissent is the most wonderful blessing put into the Bill of Rights. As Mark Twain said, the American people were given three of the greatest benefits in history, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and the common sense never to dare to use either. (laughs) Any progress that has been made in this country in the last 200 years has been by the people who lack the common sense to never use either and do use their freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And this not only involves the war that George Bush is waging against the Arabs right now, but the war that he's waging against almost everybody in this room, including the speaker. He has been at war with us ever since he took office. He declared war on us even before he took office. He calls it a war on uh, certain substances. But actually, it's a war on everybody who dissents from the official dogmas about these substances. So it is very hard for me not to feel a certain sense of kinship with the people in Iraq who have all these bombs dropping on them. George Bush is at war with me, too. And he's doing it all because, he, to be charitable about it, he is misinformed because of the reasons I have, uh, I have already listed. The only way George Bush is ever going to call off any of his wars oh, by, uh, is if there is enough dissent and if the people who dare to dissent have the persistence to reiterate and go on with the struggle because dissent gets drowned out very easily in, uh, in a population that has been brainwashed to be submissive and obedient. Support our troops. I've heard that so much in the last couple of weeks. Uh, this uh, is an example of semantic hypnosis. Uh, support our troops by the people who say it means leave them there until, they, uh, until most of them get killed or have their, uh, their arms blown off or their genitals blown off or they lose their eyesight, or they come back in wheelchairs. That's supporting them. Anybody who wants to bring them home alive isn't supporting them. Now I ask you, in that, kind, in, in that meaning of support, do you want to be supported? I don't want them supporting me. I want to keep my arms. I want to keep my eyes. I want to keep my schlong. I don't want to be supported that way. What kind of support is that? No, you know what that, you know what that really means? Ring Laden to put it in four words. Shut up, he explained. (laughs) And that is the basic structure of all arguments that tell us we shouldn't think for ourselves. And if we do have the temerity to think for ourselves, we certainly shouldn't speak out loud what we have been thinking. Well, I hope this weekend, with a lot of people who dare to speak their mind and tell what they know about psychedelics, I hope this is one small part that will contribute something to the struggle by which eventually the American people will learn to take advantage of the Bill of Rights and dare to dissent, dare to be dissidents, and dare to try to correct the government when it's absolutely f- crazy. <laughs> now,
Now, it is my very great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Timothy Leary. Um, introducing Dr. Leary uh, is kind of superfluous. All you got to do is say Timothy Leary and the audience goes wild, generally. Uh, I would like to try something different and really introduce him. To most of the American people, Dr. Leary is known as the LSD guru. And most newspapers, I believe, have it set up as one lump of type. Timothy Leary, LSD guru, so they don't have to reset it every time. Uh, Dr. Leary uh, was one of the pioneers of group therapy back in the 1950s. When Leary first went into group therapy, uh, some elderly people in psychology and psychiatry were saying group therapy is an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. Now it's, of course, the most popular and form of therapy and obviously the most effective. All the 12-step programs are variations on group therapy. Dr. Leary designed the Leary Interpersonal Grid, which is the most widely used diagnostic grid in this country. It's used in the California prison system and probably in the California educational system. Probably most of you have taken uh, the verbal form, or the written form of that test at some time in your careers. Yes, he was the LSD guru. He did, a, he did a lot of very important research with LSD in the 60s. Then they put him in the penalty box. On the more advanced planets, people who make great discoveries are put in the Hall of Fame. On the backward planets, we put them in jail. Uh, Leary in the 70s wrote a series of really brilliant books combining psychology and futurism and uh, these books never got the circulation they deserved because he has been so smeared and misrepresented in the mass media. But Leary considers future stages of evolution in those books. He talks about things like, why, does, why do astronauts and the Russian cosmonauts, why do they report experiences very similar to LSD? What is there about zero gravity that mutates the human nervous system in a ma manner similar to the psychedelics? What does it mean if, mo if most of the human race is going to be migrating into space at some time in the near future with mutated nervous systems, with mystical experiences, mystical experiences in quotes, similar to the, all the astronauts and cosmonauts who have gone up so far? There's a lot of longevity research going on. What does it mean when we're all going to be living a lot longer than our ancestors and migrating into space? He takes up a lot of interesting questions like that in the last 10 years, and these are very interesting and important books. In the last 10 years, he's done a great deal of work on computer software and hardware, and has put out some very interesting uh, teaching uh, programs and games. And I have known him since 1964, uh, which if I... Uh, if I haven't damaged my chromosomes uh, irreparably, that's 26 years. And he has never ceased to astound me, amaze me, perplex me, and teach me something new every time we meet. And I expect in the next 26 years he will continue to do that. And if longevity research pays off, he'll be doing that for a couple of hundred years more. It's a privilege to introduce him, and you should all feel it's a real privilege to hear his latest thinking.